Well, thank you, Ron. Good morning and welcome. Today's conference, as you all know, is on the future of PhD education. But before we look forward, I'd like to take a moment to look back, to find context for the challenges and opportunities we've gathered here today to discuss. As Shakespeare said, what's past is prologue. And that's particularly true here at Johns Hopkins, where the towering figure of one man continues to influence us today. Daniel Coit Gilman was not just our first president. He was the founder of graduate education in the United States. It was on June 13, 1878, just two years after opening its doors, that Johns Hopkins University awarded its first PhDs to four men, Henry Carter Adams in political economy, Thomas Craig in mathematics, Josiah Royce in philosophy, and Ernest Seiler in Greek. They received their degrees after having proven through written and oral examinations their proficiency in a principal and subsidiary subject, submitted an elaborate research-based thesis, and demonstrated a reading knowledge of Latin, French, and German, and an acquaintance with the, quote, methods of modern scientific research. But the story of Gilman's legacy really begins in 1817. That was the year that Edward Everett received a PhD from the University of Göttingen. Everett was the first of a wave of young Americans who went to find opportunities for advanced study that they could not find here in the United States. In the 19th century, some 10,000 Americans studied in Europe. In fact, many of the founding faculty and students of the young Johns Hopkins had followed Everett's footsteps and sought advanced training abroad. Three of the four men in that first group of PhDs had previously studied in Germany. And of Johns Hopkins' first four professors, Basil Gildersleeve had a PhD from the University of Göttingen. James Sylvester, an Englishman, had studied at Cambridge. Ira Remsen had a PhD from the University of Göttingen and had been a lecturer at, lecturer at the University of Tübingen. And Henry Rowland had studied in Berlin. Gilman himself experienced a lack of opportunities for specialized advanced study. In 1852 and 1853, he did graduate study at Yale and at Harvard. But he was frustrated that even under the aegis of outstanding teachers like Professor Noah Porter of Yale, graduate studies could avail very little without official support and encouragement. The following winter, he attended lectures at the University of Berlin. In 1861, Yale awarded the first doctorate in the United States. The University of Pennsylvania followed a decade later, and Harvard a few years after that. But these graduate programs continued to be peripheral, subsumed into the work of the college, involving very few students, mostly alumni, and given little emphasis and little support. In planning for the new university, the Johns Hopkins trustees conferred with Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard. When he was asked whether the new university should offer advanced education, Eliot replied, the postgraduate course is a matter far off for you, not until you have organized the whole of the college course. Only in the fifth year of existence of the college could that question practically present itself. Eliot, like his contemporaries, thought of graduate study as simply an extension of undergraduate work completed at the same institution. Given great freedom by the trustees in designing Johns Hopkins, Gilman was determined to establish something different in Baltimore, a new type of university that would fulfill the unmet needs of Everett and those who followed behind seeking greater knowledge. But this new institution would not only transmit existing knowledge, as was the custom of American institutions, like the British universities on which they were modeled, but like German universities, would seek to produce new knowledge. 
Research, Gilman believed, was desirable not just for its own sake, that is, for its ability to push the boundaries of knowledge, but also for its effectiveness as a method of graduate training. In English universities, the choice was always said to, between, to be between a good instructor and a good investigator. But Gilman, adopting the German notion of the unity of teaching and research, believed that in fact the best teachers were also the best researchers. And the best researchers were also the best teachers. Gilman remarked, learning and teaching, inquiry and instruction should never be separated. Though research was important, for Gilman, teaching was essential. Doctoral candidates at Johns Hopkins learned to teach undergraduates and general audiences alike. Among that first group of PhDs, Josiah Royce gave five public lectures on the return to Kant and, told, and taught a course on Schopenhauer. Ernest Seiler gave three public lectures on Attic Life and Society and taught a course to two undergraduate students on the Acarnians by Aristophanes. Gilman's new model of a university was a place not just of discovery, but also of specialization. In his first annual report in 1876, Gilman wrote that the trustees had agreed that a fundamental principle of the new university was that instruction should be as thorough, as advanced, and as special as the intellectual condition of the country would permit. In selecting faculty, he and the trustees considered foremost, quote, the devotion of the candidate to some particular line of study and the certainty of his eminence in that specialty, the power to pursue independent and original investigation. Yet at the same time, Gilman understood, as we do today, the dangers of extreme specialization. As an antidote, he and the university's first professors created learned societies in philology, science, and history to keep scholars of one discipline informed about work being done in other disciplines. But few survived very long, and these societies on the whole did not live up to Gilman's expectations. He would have likely appreciated our own challenges in encouraging the development of interdisciplinary programs. A correlate to the new university's focus on discovery and specialization was freedom. Freedom to follow one's intellectual curiosities. Freedom to pursue opportunities with passion. Freedom to take big chances that might just lead to big discoveries. The freedom began with Mr. Hopkins, who in his will put very few restrictions on the trustees. The trustees, in turn, left the faculty unfettered, and the faculty gave great freedom to the students. In 1891, Gilman recalled that, quote, Johns Hopkins began without formulas and rules, without decrees of the faculty or the trustees, without regulations, and yet with that which is much more binding than any code, the unanimous recognition of certain clear and definite principles in respect to the methods, the duties, and the possibilities of the new university. For teachers, there was freedom in the methods of instruction, among them recitations, lectures, examinations, laboratories, libraries, field exercises, and travel. And for students, there was freedom in the selection of their studies. For Gilman, this freedom was a fundamental characteristic of what it meant to be a university, juxtaposed against the rules and restrictions of undergraduate life at that time. University freedom was a privilege earned by collegiate discipline. The idea of freedom was influenced by the German notions of independence of mind necessary for academic inquiry, though academic freedom itself was a phrase little used in the 1870s and 1880s. Indeed, in the, in the midst of a tumultuous time of labor strikes in 1886, a Cornell professor, Henry Carter Adams, gave a speech in defense of labor. 
When Henry Sage, a powerful university benefactor, demanded that he be expelled for, quote, sapping the foundations of society, Adams was quietly terminated. Now, it's not just a coincidence that Adams was among that first group of four PhDs at Johns Hopkins. The university would later recognize Adams with an honorary degree. For all of Gilman's great ideas, attempts to develop graduate education at Johns Hopkins would have in all likelihood failed had it not been for the creation of a novel fellowship system. Before opening, Johns Hopkins advertised that it would offer 10 graduate scholarships of $500 a year in addition to exemption from tuition. One of that first class of PhD recipients, Thomas Craig, had learned about the fellowships from an article in the New York Tribune and contacted Gilman at once. The two met the following week and kept in touch until Craig began his studies at Johns Hopkins. Gilman even lending him money and warning him against the dangers to his health of overstudy. In all, the trustees received 152 applications representing 46 different colleges and universities, among them Gerdigan and Heidelberg. The number of outstanding candidates was so large that the trustees decided to increase the number of fellowships from 10 to 20. Nowhere in America in 1876 was there any such program offering stipends so large or so numerous. Before 1876, the few American universities that did offer fellowship gave, gave them only to their own graduates. Having none, Johns Hopkins University chose the best applicants from around the country, establishing itself from the outset as a university of national influence. Even today, the provision of financial aid is a primary factor in the success of our doctorate programs and indicators demonstrate that the financial burden is growing. For the first time in 1999, more than half of all graduating doctorate earners had accumulated an educational debt. And across the country, the proportion who said they owed more than $20,000 has now climbed to 26%, up from less than 7% only two decades ago. Easing the financial burden for both the student and the institution, these first PhD recipients earned their degree in just two years. A few years later, the minimum number of study was increased to three, marking the beginning of a trend of the increase in the amount of time needed to earn a degree to accommodate the explosion in new knowledge and the tendency towards greater specialization. Now, like many good ideas, Gilman's thoughts about graduate education, the importance of discovery and specialization, and the necessity of freedom spread quickly. In just a few years after Johns Hopkins awarded its first PhDs, a dozen universities were making substantial provision for graduate education. And within 10 years, the Johns Hopkins Fellowship System had been widely imitated across the country. What was, what was once so innovative became widely adopted and as to make it almost commonplace. The experiment here in Baltimore transformed other older colleges into research universities and deeply influenced the shape of the new research universities such as Clark, the University of Chicago, and Stanford. At Gilman's retirement in 1902, President Eliot of Harvard acknowledged Johns Hopkins' outsized influence when he said, I want to testify that the graduate school of Harvard University started feebly in 1870 and 1871, did not thrive until the example of Johns Hopkins forced our faculty to put their strength into the development of our instruction for graduates. And what was true of Harvard was true of every other university in the land which aspired to create a school of arts and sciences. In sheer number of degrees awarded, Johns Hopkins quickly took the lead. From 1878 to 1889, Johns Hopkins awarded 151 PhDs. During that same period, Harvard granted 43 PhDs. Yale had granted 101 PhDs 
from the time it introduced the degree in 1861 to 1889. Today I might note that academic institutions across the United States grant nearly 50,000 research doctorates annually. In awarding the PhD, Gilman believed that Johns Hopkins had prepared these men for academic careers. The cadre of Johns Hopkins graduate students, he wrote, constitute in fact, though not in name, a class of young men training for professorships. And the numbers bore this out. In 1891, 15 years after the opening of Johns Hopkins University, 184 of the university's 202 PhD graduates, over 90%, were teachers, most of them on the faculties of American colleges and universities. Among that first class of PhDs, Henry Carter Adams became a professor at Cornell and then at the University of Michigan. Ernest Seiler became a professor at New York University. Josiah Royce became a professor at Harvard, and Thomas Craig, refusing an invitation from Harvard, became a professor at Johns Hopkins. In Gilman's time, college and university enrollments were expanding substantially, easily accommodating this new influx of PhDs. But that is no longer the case. So many others have adopted Gilman's model of graduate education that the supply of doctorates now exceeds the demand for academic positions. Academic job commitments among, among new PhDs fell from about 67% in the early 1970s to about 50% at the end of that decade, a mark that has remained steady to this day. The recent economic troubles have only exacerbated this imbalance, particularly in the humanities. According to the Modern Language Association's projections, there will be 39% fewer jobs in the current academic year than there were three years ago in English and in foreign languages. According to the American Historical Association, the number of positions listed during the last academic year was down 46% from just two years ago. Several months ago, the Council for Graduate Schools released a report which said that for the first time in seven years, the enrollment of first-time graduate students fell by 1.1% from the fall of 2009 to the fall of 2010. Despite the current persistent imbalance, I do not find this decline in enrollment to be an encouraging sign. In the world today, we face so many challenges, sustainable energy and the environment, water security, the promise of individualized health, the challenges of an urbanizing world. These are immensely complex problems that will require innovative solutions. We need more education, not less. But we must be willing to value career paths outside of academe. Career paths that engage social challenges and apply the results of our research to the broader community Fundamentally, Gilman believed that universities existed to reach out for a better state of society than now exists. We too should see our mission as broader than just educating the, mission, the, the generation of the next professors, but as serving the needs of society. In his inaugural address, Gilman said, universities will easily fall into ruts. Almost every epoch requires a fresh start. It is in this spirit that we've convened this conference today. Gilman has left us a tremendous legacy. The system of graduate education he established 135 years ago remains stronger than ever. Yet we must still ask ourselves if we've allowed our long-standing traditions and our years of success to let us fall into ruts. Our challenge today is to examine ourselves to turn our powers of analysis, evaluation, and skepticism on ourselves to find new ways of keep, to keep innovating without compromising the very principles that have made us who and what we are today. The preeminence of American higher education is universally acknowledged as one of our greatest and most important national resources. 
university research has brought about life and society changing inventions from which we have all benefited, not just here in America, but all around the world. For this, much is owed to Daniel Coit Gilman, whose belief in the power of research and advanced training not only opened up new possibilities for young men and soon young women here in America, but established the foundation of the research enterprise that we all benefit from today. Gilman's contribution was not just as the first president of Johns Hopkins, not just in establishing graduate education in the United States, but in founding the modern university. This is his legacy. Thank you.